builders. We want to we want to show you value, and I don't think there's any other better value add right now than to let another realtor actually that's been doing these probate classes show you exactly what what he's doing and and how to leverage it. Um, obviously, I'm on the mortgage side of things, so I don't have the experience to teach you, and nor should I, about probate. Um, so I'm going to let a trusted professional, and we have an arsenal of 50 to 100 awesome videos um, from top professionals in the industry that close hundreds of loans um, and and do a lot of deals um, that we can we can keep showing you and things like that. But I think this is the best way to actually, you know, show some value. Brian, what would you, you want to touch on that? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, obviously we're in a place now where we're just looking to add uh, tools to your tool belt. I mean, you should always be looking to um, improve upon your craft and who better, you know, I, I always, whenever I tell people or coach people, you know, some people starting out that the, you know, six figures becomes a goal and they're like, I want to make, six figures well what do you do you go learn from the person that's already making six figures and they leave you a little bit of nuggets on how to get there and then you get the six figures you go i want to make 250 how do i learn from that person so you go find the person doing those behaviors and they leave you a little bit of nuggets on what to do so my job and what jesse's talking about our job is to help you get those nuggets from people that are already where you might want to be um and at the end of the day we're all going to take something good out of it to help us implement new behaviors into our business that are going to help us get to another level. Uh, otherwise, we just keep doing the same behaviors and keep getting the same results if we're lucky. So um, we'll jump right into it. This will kind of give us a whole overview uh, of the probate real estate and hopefully give you guys some tools. Um, we, I think I have a hard stop at 1115, so we're going to roll through this. It's going to take us right up to about 11 little after 11. Um, if you guys have any questions, we'll do a quick Q&A at the end of it and then uh, get you guys on your day and, and start being productive. So without further ado, I'm just going to roll it. Just give me a thumbs up, Jesse, with the audio. I'm going to run it through the uh, computer. Hopefully it's solid. So here we go. Well, all right, everybody, I want to welcome you to the National Lunch and Learn League sponsored entirely mm -hmm by Annie Mac Home Mortgage. And that mortgage loan professional in the room with you right now is responsible for it's coordinating Jesse. one Jesse. national on the first Wednesday of every month during the 2017 calendar year. We set out with a goal to become the number one realtor referred mortgage company in every market that we enter. And that means that we covet our relationship to mortgage partners, real estate referral partners like you for the pre-qualifications and loan applications of your uh, valuable clientele. My name is Russ Fitzpatrick. I'm one of the founders of a program that we call Animac Works, a technology suite of services, services that we call My Work Suite. And of course, this National Lunch and Learn League. We're so proud of our relationship to top tier real estate brokerage operations across the country. And during the last six and a half years, it's been my pleasure and my privilege to build real estate referral partnerships at the brokerage level with over 2,900 real estate brokerages. Today, we have over 32,000 real estate agents that enjoy some relationship to either Animac Works or the My Work Suite technology. And now, through this National Lunch and Learn League, we can help and serve and be in service to our real estate referral partners in a more meaningful way than ever before. Our success truly is measured by yours. And as real estate agents, we know that you guys control and you guys refer and you guys um, recommend or even validate a couple of different mortgage referral partners. And because of that, we've been able to turn um, our relationships with you into billions of dollars in mortgages across the country. And we pride ourselves on several things. Um, because of the MyWork Suite technology, and I want to introduce this to you if you've never heard it before, <clears throat> we can help you take more listings. We manage tens of thousands of listings through our eBull program, our For Sale Buyer Assistance CRM. 
We manage listing inventory acquisition through our expired listing program called the expired listing gold mine. We have a very uh, well-oiled machine called Farming Fridays that helps our real estate referral partners take listings. And because of the MyWork Suite technology, we now have an IDX feed from your MLS so we can automate your Facebook and social media posts about these beautiful listings that you guys have in your inventory. It's just another way that Animac Home Mortgage and Animac Works can work more arm in arm with our real estate referral partners. Partners. One last little commercial, and that is the question of why so many realtors trust Annie Mac Home Mortgage. Number one, from the executive team of Joseph Panabianco, Ryan Cuby, Christine Beck with Vincent Ngui, uh, the entire executive team, Jay Leibowitz, Matt Buckley, there is such an incredible entrepreneurial energy it, within the executive team of Annie Mac Home Mortgage that you couldn't be more proud of a company. And then you take a look at the caliber of loan originators that they've aligned forces with in every market we've entered. And you've got to acknowledge that it's the people that make a company great. And in Annie Mac Home Mortgage, people are the uh, exceptional service providers nation, nationally for us that make it happen. The other thing I'd like to say, and I've been a realtor for 32 years. But I would put in air quotes like Joey from Friends, if you remember that scene when he said, uh, virtually every product that's available, and I put air quotes around that because I'm sure there's some one-off kind of weird, niche unique product somewhere that we don't have. But virtually every product that's available in the mortgage lending industry is available through Andy Mac Home Mortgage. And that means... If you're looking for a one-off CTP loan or a builder product loan or a renovation lending loan, if you have a senior in your family that's looking for a reverse mortgage, if you have a reverse mortgage purchase situation where somebody's taking some equity out of their existing home and buying a bigger home or even a, an empty nester home and they're over the age of 62, we've got reverse purchase mortgages. Um, we have every government uh, underwritten or guaranteed or insured product, FHA, VA, USDA, all the products are represented, including jumbo products. So you can never find another product. But for me, having been a realtor, been in your shoes for 32 years, it's the process that's vital. And by that, I mean, I want total transaction transparency from my mortgage partner. I want to know if the appraisal misses the mark by an eighth of a point. I want to know if the if the credit score dips two points, I need to know in advance because my commission is $12,864. And I need to know what's going on with this file as it's going on. Give me a big amen if you're a realtor and you want a total transaction transparency and to know what's going on with your files. Well, today, I want to tell you that you have total transaction transparency through a mortgage application that goes on your smartphone it is called the Easy Mortgage App at Annie Mac Home Mortgage. It gives you, the realtor, and your partner push notices and benchmarks whenever a transaction uh, benchmark is reached. I'm talking about if the borrower is hesitant to turn in some documentation. The day that the appraisal is ordered, the day the appraisal happens, the day the appraisal is received, verifications of employment submitted, uh, when the loan is submitted to underwriting, approved, and cleared to close. These are all the total transaction transparency portal that you as a real estate agent and your borrower have access to through the easy mortgage app at Annie Mac Home Mortgage. So that's my commercial and I hopefully I didn't take up too much of your time, but if you take advantage of the mortgage app, if you take care of virtually every product that's available in the mortgage industry, and finally, if the people are trustworthy, credible, knowledgeable, and maybe even a little likable. Hopefully we can earn your business moving forward and work together with your valuable clientele to protect those large real estate commissions and really get you earning more moving forward. The National Lunch and Learn League is a vehicle that happens on the first Wednesday of every month. And today I call the topic, take six listings this year without cold calling. 
<laughs> I cold called for a lot of years. I was a Mike Ferry coached realtor. I was a I was uh, coached by Floyd Wickman during the Sweat Hogs program. Give me an amen if you were a Mike Ferry realtor or a Floyd Wickman sweat hog back in the day. We learned how to smile and dial real early. But I want to tell you, we beta tested this program with several brokerages before we decided to implement it at our National Lunch and Learn League. And Mike Torres is the real deal. He understands how to work with the court system, with probate attorneys, with wills and probate. And he really understands how you personally should be able to take six listings this year without ever having to make a cold call. So without further ado, Mr. Mike Torres and the probate work system from Annie Mac Home Mortgage. Thank, thank you, Russ. I really appreciate that. Uh, but let me also take a moment to thank you, Russ, for the invitation, but also to Animac Works. You guys are doing a phenomenal job with these educational uh, lessons that you are sharing with uh, thousands and thousands of people across this country. So um, thanks again. Appreciate it. All right. Well, for all the listeners, uh, let, let me just kind of give you an idea of what I'm about to do. I'm going to share with you in a very global perspective how probate real estate works. And I've been using this for my goodness almost 30 years now. It's been a long time since I got involved in, uh, in probate real estate. And today over 9,000 people use this realtor, I mean, I'm sorry, this realtor, they use this, uh, this, this system that we built um, across America. So it's lots of information. If you don't have a piece of paper, please grab a piece of paper somewhere really quick, get a pen because I'm going to give you a lot of good information. I'm going to teach you how you can prospect in this niche market of probate real estate, okay? So with that said, let's get going. Let me start with the basic concept. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, real estate is the best vehicle to create wealth in this country. That has been undisputed. So it's a really exciting vehicle to jump in. But here's the challenge. In our business, in our real estate business, this is the statistics. 9% of realtors write about 10% of the sales. That means there's an average of three to four homes per year. And we also seen that about 1% of realtors write about 90% of the sales. So the question is why? Why the discrepancy? And what is this blue area represents for us in the business of real estate, for us realtors? It represents there's more listing opportunities than ever before. But the question is, what's holding us back? What is it? What is it that is not allowing us to go and explore these other niches in real estate or be able to be exposed to more, more uh, education? Simple words. What is it? So let me give you some of the top reasons why realtors are having a hard time generating more money. That's the truth. And I got this from, I mean, I travel all over the country. I'm literally from East Coast to the West Coast. And... Um, as I travel and meet realtors from different parts of the country, they share different opinions about why they're struggling, why their business is not moving the way they wanted to move, why their finances is kind of getting a little bit more uh, challenging for them to be able to move forward financially. And here are the five reasons. They said, well, Mike, it's difficult to locate a qualified listing opportunity. I'm like, okay, that's fair enough. Number two, there, there is no unique selling proposition to differentiate yourself from the crowd. Three, we need access to the tools creating today's new top producers. Four, difficult to be located by a seller due to the high competition in the marketplace. And ladies and gentlemen, that is very true. We have a very competitive industry. And the last one, which is said, the real estate market is totally unpredictable. Okay, so I did a little bit of research. But before I move into this chart that I want to show you, let me share with you what I'm going to emphasize today in our one hour plus uh, presentation, <coughs> excuse me. So I'm going to emphasize my education today in how to find the qualified listing opportunity and how the real estate market in this real estate market of probate is very predictable. So I'm gonna show you two out of the five challenges that most realtors will share with me over time. So let's jump in. Well, if we look at this chart that I recently uh, uh, obtained from uh, NAR, it shows, yeah, the market is all over the place. It is true. It's an upside down market. So there's no, you know, if you look at the market as a whole, it's very hard to predict what's coming next. Now, 
Probably real estate is the answer. Let me explain to you guys why. First of all, we're in the cycle of life. So when someone passes away, they have to file with the probate court what we call the petition for probate. Write this down if you're taking notes. Petition for probate. That is the document that is filed with the court, and that's the qualified lead. So if you, no matter where you are across this country, locate your local probate court, go to the court, find out where the records are, and then ask for a file. Literally, ask for a file. May I have a probate file? And the person behind the counter, they might even direct you to a computer. They might say, look, no, well, here's a file, here's two files. And now when you open the file, you look for, you're looking for the document that is called the petition for probate. Once the petition has been filed, then now the process begins. And in the process, they're gonna have to disclose what's the outstanding debt that the deceased person left behind. So the court is gonna see. Now, if you have outstanding debt, but you don't have enough liquidity, the court can actually issue an order to sell the real estate. So now the court is saying, Mr. Personal Representative, I want you to sell the real estate because you need to pay all this outstanding debt and I'm giving you the order to do so. So when you have this necessity and the court is saying, you gotta do this to make it happen, what do you have in your hands? A listing opportunity. And that is happening, oh my gosh, that is happening all over the country. But the beautiful part of this formula is this connected to the life cycle. So this unpredictable market, it becomes predictable because everyone, all of us are in the journey of life. Every day, the files that come through the probate courts across this country. So here is the niche market that will never, ever, ever end. And that's where the opportunity comes from. So remember, there is a high motivation, a high need, and the court may get involved to make that motivation actually go faster because they have to take care of the outstanding debts. All right, let me share with you some research. This is really gonna paint the picture of why, if you have never thought about it, getting into private real estate, hopefully this will spark the interest for you to begin to look into this niche market. Now, this is a study by the aging of America and the evolution of the aging population by Jennifer M. Brock. And she writes, according to George Moshes, director of Georgia State Center for Mature Consumer Studies, the 55 plus age group controls more than three fourths of this country's wealth. And the 65 plus group has twice as, much, twice as much for capita income as the average baby boomer. What they're saying is that 75% of the wealth in this country is controlled by the 60 plus group. That's the seniors. Now here's another study. This is by the Center for Mature Consumer Studies and the Roper Organization for Modern Maturity Magazine. They write, Someone turns 50 years of age every six seconds. The over 85 age group is the fast and growing segment of the population. By 2020, the senior population will number approximately 150 million people. Now listen up. The last census, according to the last census, there's about 320 million people in America. So if 150 million people are going to be seniors, that represents that one third of the population in this country is seniors, one third by 2020. And these guys control the real estate market because they're the one that have most of the wealth. 75% of them control the wealth in this country. Now look at the next line. The current senior population possesses over $900 billion in spending money. Now, this is what I want you to start thinking. Do people live longer today? Yes, they do. But what happens when you live longer? You spend more money. So what's going on with these seniors is that they're living longer and by the time they die, most of the spending money is gone, which means that the estate has to settle. There's one thing you cannot avoid, taxes. So they have to pay taxes. The estate has to pay taxes for it. And if there is no liquidity, guess what? We have to sell something. And most of these seniors die with, I tell you, I'm gonna show you the statistic in a second. They die with free and clear homes. So I hope this is beginning to paint the picture. Now, the last, uh, the last point, nearly a quarter of householders age 65 to 69 have a net worth of $250,000 or more. So again, here is another study saying the wealth is with the seniors. Now this one is by statesettlement.com and they write approximately, $17 trillion in inheritance will pass through the probate and estate settlement by 2022. 
over 2 million adults die each year in the United States. Now, you and I know that these $17 trillion is not cash, it's not stocks, it's not bonds. This is real estate. The most valuable asset to any estate is the house. So you're looking about probably 90% of that 17 trillion will be in real estate. And that's what the opportunity is, guys. I hope this is making sense to all of you. Now, here's another study. This is by probatedata.com. Probatedata.com, what they do is they pull leads. They pull probate leads from different parts of the country. And based on their data collection, they concluded that 70% of probate real estate is free and clear, and 18% is commercial real estate. So if you're listening to this, no matter what area in real estate you're involved, whether it's commercial or residential, probate real estate will bring you leads that you can go after and be able to lease all those properties. Because you and I know that whoever controls the listing controls the money. That's the reason why I'm sharing this information for all of you. So you can begin to go and capture more listings so you increase your bottom line. Okay? Now, oh, excuse me, I got some, sorry about that. So what I want to do is I want to show you how you find this information, how you find this information. So what you're looking at the screen right now is an inventory. This property had to be in, happened to be in Los Angeles, California. So in order for you to get hold of this information, you got to have a case number. So remember when I told you earlier, go to the courthouse, pull the record. The person behind the county may ask you two questions. Do you, uh, do you know the name of the deceased or do you know the case number? Well, you're not going to know either one because you just kind of knew at this thing, if you've done it before, you're kind of familiar with the process. But if you're totally new, you say, well, you're not gonna say, I don't know anything. What you can do is two things. You can ask them if they have access to those records via their computer, and if they do, you can go down and put any name of any person they passed away, make up a name. Or you can go to, let's say, a legal newspaper, either online or locally in your area, and legal newspapers, and look for a column that will say, and no, uh, notice to administer. Notice to administer is stayed up and it gives you the name of the person. So any of those two, uh, two avenues that I just showed you, that I share with you, they can give you access to the case number. Once you find the case number, then now you're in the system. So for example, then when you're looking at the screen right now, you have case number 160292. So what is the next case number? 293, 294, and so on and so on. And now you can begin to pull those records and you're looking for what we call petition for probate. I hope this is making sense. So now, once you have that, look at this. You can go anywhere in America and be able to find inventory. Nevada, Florida, Indiana, basically anywhere. And now you're in the system. Guys, how much does it cost to go to the courthouse? Nothing. You're gonna pay for parking. And if you go during your lunch hour, you're gonna pay for lunch because you gotta eat something. But now you, you, you enter into a world where you have endless leads and they're ready for you. And they are free. It doesn't cost anything to look at these records. So it's a really beautiful niche and it's full of opportunities in there. All right. So let me give you an idea of what probate properties look like. Usually the probate property, the person who lived in the house for the last 20, 25 years before they pass away, the house, they can't keep up with the property, so they need, these properties need some work. They need to be remodeled, they need to be upgraded, which in this case is perfect for all of our <laughs> investor clients. So this is a beautiful pool that we can go find investment opportunities either for ourselves, because I know some of us are investors, or for our clients who are investors. Now, this example out of Long Beach, California, the, the investor has invested $20,000 in it, and now you have a, here you go, a profit of 113, 820. And I tell you, I know California is, is a little bit uh, incredible, is, is, a, is a crazy market, but I can do the same thing in Texas, I can do it in Indiana, I can do it in Louisiana, I can do it in New York, I can do it in Florida, I can do it anywhere. Because as long as the people living in that, in, in that space, there's always gonna be a profit file being filed every day. People are dying every day and people are, born every day. So it's just a life cycle. Um, now, you can do different things. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna share this little quick story because it's Terrell and one of our students. And what he did, he's a broker, but also slash investor. And this is what he did, just to get your wheels going, guys. He went ahead, went to the courthouse, pulled the record. Remember, petition for probate. 
Once he found the partition for probate, he identified who was the personal representative, where did they live, what property was involved, and the name of the deceased person, and he began contacting this individual. So he contacted the person, locked out the contract. Once he locked out the contract, he assigned the contract to one of his own clients. This is called assignment of a contract. And I know we can, we can spend like two hours talking about assignments, but just if you're familiar, you know what I'm talking about. It's basically you're moving the paper. And because of that movement, he made 56,000 bucks. Never work, never touch it, never clean it. It was a really nice uh, strategy that he used where he just moving paper back and forth. So this niche market can give you so many different opportunities for you or for your investor clients. It's a beautiful niche. All right, so there are two things that we're always looking. I'm always looking for equity and motivated sellers. I want to work with equity. I don't want to go work in a upside down. I don't want any more short sales. I want something, I want my traditional listing. I want equity in the property and I want to know, I want to get hold of people who are ready to move so I can close that and put the listing on the market. Now, between 1946 and 1964, 78.2 million people were born. We're talking about the baby boomer generation. Now, this is when it gets really interesting. The baby boomer generation today is somewhere between mid 50s to mid 60s. These are the people that capture the majority of the wealth in this country. These baby boomers were the offspring of the people that went through the Great Depression. And they were raised with only one mindset. You save money, you buy your house, and you invest in real estate. These kids were, from the beginning, real estate is the safest investment you can ever make. And that's what they've done all their lives. So today, the baby boomer owns property. They're the investors of today. These guys own three, four, four, five different units or, pro, you know, or houses, for example. But here's the thing. These guys don't spend the money. These guys, every time that they save, they invest it in something. So you have a, your average baby boomer drives a four to five year old car, it's paid for, and they drive to their, their investments, they, they keep an eye on their investments, they're maintaining their investments, but they have no money. This is what the baby boomer I was saying, I'm broke, I have no money. It's not that they don't have any money, is that they are cash poor. This is an asset rich cash poor generation. So your equity is, is tied up with these people. That's where the equity is located. I hope this is making sense. Now, this is another very interesting study by the US Bureau of the Census. And I wanna make a point here, look at the data line. Between 2010 and 2020, in our decade, people are living longer, like I mentioned earlier. This is a study of 60 plus. So at the beginning of 2010, we had about 58 million seniors who were 60 years older. By the end of our decade, we will have over 78 million seniors. Which, what does that translate to for us? Which means they're living longer, they're spending their money. When they die, they have no liquidity. And when there's no liquidity, they have to sell something. And the most valuable asset to the estate is the home. The, as time goes by, all these properties now become hot listings because they need to liquidate to settle the estate because people are losing all their money. It, it's, it's, it's the perfect storm in, in so many ways you can say that. Now, a lot of you guys are thinking, well, and, and as, I, as I teach people, they say, well, Mike, uh, in my neighborhood, I, in my farm area, we, you know, we're dealing with very wealthy individuals and they don't have to go through the probate process. Well, let me explain. You can only avoid probate if you have a fully vested living trust. There's only two ways you can settle an estate. Either go through the probate process or you have a fully vested living trust, which means fully vested means that everything was transferred from the person's name into the trust. And when they die, the trust controls everything. And there's a trustee who will handle the whole thing. If something is left out of the trust, that means that that piece that it was left out has to go through the probate court to put it back into the trust. And every time anyone files any document at any probate court in this country becomes a public record. And that's where you and I can go and get those leads. So yeah, statistically, only 5% of Americans have a fully vested trust, which means only 5% of the people can die and avoid probate completely because everything was done in. And you're probably thinking, but wait, hold on. How, how is it possible that if I set up my trust correctly, how can my trust ended up going through probate? Let me give you an example. You guys probably seen this. The person sets the trust, the attorney sets the trust. They move everything into the trust. The house go from their name to the trust name. Five years later, they want to refinance and lower their interest rate. 
So they take the house out of the trust to refinance and they forget to put it back. So when they die, if that house is out of the trust, now they have to go through the probate court and ask the court to put the house back into the trust. Are you with me on this? I hope this is making sense. So if they have to put the house back into the trust, it becomes a public record. Now I know who died, who's a trustee, and what they want to do. So remember, it has to be fully vested to avoid completely the probate court. So if 25% of Americans have a fully vested trust, how many people, how many estates will go through the probate court? 95%. 95% of Americans will have to settle their estate through the probate process. Now, I'm going to show you a collage of people and every single person, this is going to blow your mind, guys. Every single person in that collage, their estate went through the probate court. Let's see if you recognize some of their faces. Look at that. Let's see. Uh, let me go from left to right. Um, with the Houston, Pablo Picasso, Sonny Bono, Michael Jackson. Mohammed Ali, uh, famous aviator, Howard Hughes. Yes, you, you, don't be shocked, guys. Yes, Steve Jobs' estate went through the probate process because when he died, he had everything in a trust, but one account was never put inside the trust. It was an investment account. And because it wasn't put inside the trust, they had to go through the probate court, asking the court to put that investment back in the trust. And the moment they filed the paperwork, it became a public record. I saw that. Personally, I saw a copy of his petition for probate. It was crazy. And then look at that. Very wealthy man, very intelligent man. And right below, James Gandolfini, you have uh, the uh, Heath Ledger, which was that money for you guys. Oh, the Joker. I'm sorry, but the Joker. Uh, top hat guy is J.P. Morgan. Next to him is uh, Charles Schwab, Roy Disney, Paul Walker. Right below Paul Walker is a uh, famous painter. Thomas Kincaid. Uh, and then you have Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, Natalie Cole, Anna Nicole Smith, Amy Winehouse, Robin Williams. Yes, he had a fully vested trust. Everything was done correctly. But now the wife and the children couldn't get along in terms of the real estate. So they had to go through the probate court for the court to settle that dispute. And guess what? That Napa home up in Northern California eventually sold for, I think it was like $22 million. So <laughs> wouldn't you have to love to have that listing? And then you have uh, uh, Seymour. You have uh, Roy Disney, and the last guy who, very famous guy who recently passed, is Prince. So he was a group of individuals who were brilliant, wealthy, but yet they were not ready. Very few people are completely ready in case something will happen to them. In, in our society, we don't talk about that. We, 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 we do, well, I always tell people, yeah, we do earthquake drills, we do fire drills, we do all kinds of drills, but we never do the drill in case somebody will happen to us, what happens. So this is why we have so many, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people going through probate every single day in this country, every single day. And this is across America, thousands, not just thousands, thousands of people, thousands of, uh, of states get filed every day. All right, let's continue. So let's talk about the person who is going to be in charge of the estate. Now, this individual is known as the personal representative. They're also known as executors or administrators. Okay, let me explain to you why a person will be called an executor versus an administrator. An executor means that there was a will on record. An administrator means that there was no will on record. So the will names the person who is going to be in charge, the executor, and whenever there is no will, Anyone can file with the court, and the court now will have to approve that person. So the court kind of indirectly appoints the individual based on their petition for probate. That's exactly. So when you're thinking about prospecting, you want to find out who's the executor, administrator, or personal representative. It's the same person. That is the person that makes all the decisions on behalf of the estate. That is the person that's going to sign your listing agreement. Okay? Now, these people are responsible for many things. So let me share with you some of the things these people are responsible for. One, they're responsible for the mortgage. They're responsible for the insurance on the property. Any association fees, any medical, hospital, funeral bills gotta be paid. Any property taxes, probate taxes, state and federal taxes. They're responsible for any attorney fees and estate settlement fees. So just imagine for one second, just imagine, because this is the only way we can really begin to see the, uh, the individual work. 
Imagine your loved one passed away. I still have to go to work. I am married. I might have a kid, so my kids might be old enough that they're gone. And all of a sudden, I am responsible for this state who has outstanding debts. The attorney is contacting me, asking me for paperwork that I don't know where it is. The family members are now fighting because they want to know what is their share of the uh, <laughs> the, the benefit, the, you know, the, their inheritance, basically. So all these moving pieces are taking place at one time. Plus, you got to manage your own personal life. These guys are so overwhelmed that all they want to do after a few months, maybe after a month and a half of this pressure, they just want to move forward. They just want to move on. So you have the perfect motivated seller. The equity is coming from the senior generation right now, and the motivation is coming from settling the estate. That's what's going on. That's where the opportunity is coming from, okay? All right. Here's another very interesting observation. And I, when I saw this for the first time, I'm thinking, oh, wow, this is bigger than I even thought. So let me kind of break it down for you. The baby boomer generation is the wealthiest living generation alive based on research. I shared that with you at the beginning of our conversation. And these guys are between mid fifties to late sixties, somewhere in that neighborhood. Now, the Gen X generation is the poorest living generation today. These guys are between mid thirties to upper forties. Let me explain. Generation X, these people between thirties to upper forties, they went through the recession. They have foreclosures show sales, they're the ones that did uh, loan modification, and these people went into bankruptcy. So when you have this generation and it does financial duress, now the question is, this is when I begin to put all these the dots together. Generation X is the children of the baby boomer generation. The baby boomer generation controls the wealth in this country, and their children went through a recession and lost a lot of their financial life. It was gone in a very quickly, in a very short time. So now, fix my curse over here. So now, what happens when their parents passed away and the most valuable asset to the estate is the house? You and I know that is the most valuable asset and trickles down to Generation X. What do you think these kids are going to do? The first thing these kids are going to do is liquidate. Because remember, you can't sell a house if the person is no longer alive. If, the person, if you're gonna sell a property when the person is dead, that has to be settled. Either you have a trust, you're a trustee with a trust, or you're going through the probate process to get the right documentation to be able to sell that property. So they're going to settle the estate first. As they settle the estate, they're gonna take care of all this outstanding debt, and now at the end, they're gonna distribute the inheritance. And that's how these people are gonna gain the, the money to get back Somebody has cash in the hand, we pick up the phone, call them up, and I say, hey, listen, from time to time, you might get some unexpected money, you, and why don't we let's look into investing, let's look into buying some passive income, let's look how we can take this inheritance and make it grow for your goal. All my realtor friends and my students, you stay in the conversation with them. 
because that in about six months that. later after the property is sold, they're going to receive an inheritance. Now these people are going to receive 50, 100, you know, $200,000 checks because that's the inheritance from the parents. And what do you do when you know that somebody has cash in the hand? We pick up the phone, call them up and I say, hey, listen, from time to time, you might get some unexpected money. You, and why don't we, let's look into investing. Let's look into buying some passive income. Let's look at how we can take this inheritance and make it grow for your golden years. So it's a perfect combination, guys. I've seen some of my students generating two and three commission checks out of one file by doing what I just taught you to do. So it's a great, great niche. All right. Let me continue teaching you guys. So there's different types of files that go through the probate court. When you think of probate, these are files the people that passed away. That's what the dead people. Two, you get guardianships. And guardianships is another file that has to go through the probate court when someone needs help. Let me give you an example. Uh, let's say mom. Mom is not doing well. She needs help with medication. She's forgetting to eat. Something along those lines. Dementia is kicking in. Uh, Parkinson's. These are diseases that we don't have any cure for. I mean, my, father, my grandfather uh, passed away of dementia. So when he got really ill, my aunt took cover of his estate well if he needs which at that point he was beginning to need more care and towards the end he was a 24 7 care what happens when a person needs that type of service what are our options we're looking at uh, assistant living homes we're looking at nursing homes we're looking at 24 7 nurse we're looking at in home health care and those services are extremely expensive you and i know that an average assistant living home in this country is about starts at three thousand dollars a month and it can go up to six thousand dollars a month so it's a very expensive now in the case of my grandfather he needed care he needed services so what did my aunt have to do liquidate something i i think i made the point the most valuable asset to anyone's estate is the property so we had to liquidate his house so he can receive the care that he needed at the time that is happening all across this country because our generation, our people are getting older. This is why we see so many assistant living homes popping up everywhere. Uh, nursing homes popping up. In-home health care is a booming industry. So in order for them to provide this care, they liquidate it. And someone is taking over their estate. And that happens through the probate court. So when you think of probate, probate is a giant niche. It's beyond people that passed away. It's people who need care and they cannot make those decisions themselves. And the last one, uh, you know, my, the last one is called living trust. Now, the reason why we, uh, like I said, living trust go through the probate court is because something was left out. And when I see living trust as a file, the majority of time I know is the house is the house that was taken out they did something with it and they never put it back in so that's when i see living trust going at the pro to the probate court those are pretty good leads so if you're thinking about net you know start getting into this niche market if you're thinking about you know this is a vehicle that i can use to generate more listings probate is huge you can literally spend an entire career just dealing with probate only you can and, and i think uh, at this point in time you can spend a big chunk of your career just dealing with guardianship only, especially adults because they're the ones that need help. Uh, living trust, it's a small, you know, it, it comes through it, but between probate and guardianship, you'll be busy until the day you retire. This is what I love about this niche market, guys. This is recession proof. So if you're looking for something different, if you're looking for a vehicle to generate more qualified leads, this is what I was talking about, qualified leads, this is it. And so very few people are applying this. This is what I, I call a shadow market. And right now, the entire country is waking up to see what else is out there. What other vehicles can I use in my real estate business? What can I add to my current prospecting program? So I'm not saying drop everything you're doing. I'm saying is take this niche and add it to what you're currently doing. And that's what our students are doing. They're going like, let me add this into my business and the business grow because of this. And I've seen realtors turning this into a full-time department. I've seen some broker houses where they have a probate department, where they have two or three uh, junior brokers or just realtors out there just specializing in this. Become the probate realtor in your community and you'll never run out of business, okay? All right, there's certain documents that are extremely important. Let me share those with you. 
The first one is called petition for probate. The petition for probate is the first document that gets filed with the court. Now, once the court gets that petition, the court will review the paperwork and then the court will issue the order. And the order is basically an answer for the petition. So the next document that gets issued, it becomes orders for probate. At the beginning of the process during the petition phase, the person who wants to become the executor or administrator does not have any legal powers. They become legally in charge of the estate the moment that the orders are issued by the court. Let me repeat that. They have no legal powers until they receive the orders from the court. Once they have the orders, now they can begin making decisions on behalf of the estate. Now they can list the property for sale. Okay. Now, once they get the orders, there's one more document they need to close the real estate transaction, the real estate sale. It's called letters of administration. This document is issued by the court. So once the orders have given, then the next thing is they can list the property, they can open, open, you know, go to the attorney's office, go to the escrow offices, you know, title, whoever, however is being handled in your state, and then they, they will wait until they receive the letters to, to close the whole, the whole transaction. So three basic documents, petition for probate, which is your lead, or is for probate, which make them legal, letters of administration will close the deal, okay? Now, from petition to order, this is on a national average. Let me repeat this, national average. It takes about 30 to 40 days. From orders to letters, it takes another 30 to 40 days. So if you begin prospecting and you go to the courthouse and you pull brand new leads, remember, they don't have any legal powers. So if you're prospecting these new people, probably 99.999% of them, they'll tell you, don't call me again. They hang up on you. You're an ambulance chaser. You have no heart. Don't ask for the business because it will not work. They just started the process. So if you call in someone within the first 30 days from filing, it's about building the relationship. You know, hi, my name is blank. I'm sorry for the loss of your loved one. Just want to extend my services. Is there any question you have? How can I be of service to you? It's building that relationship. And that's what you want to do. Once they get the orders, they've been in the process for about a month. So now if they want to move forward with selling the property, now you can talk about market analysis. You can talk about how we can stage it. What can we do? You can talk about what's the potential of this piece of real estate and how you're going to be able to get a dollar for them. And now they can sign the listing agreement. Okay. I hope this is making sense. So there's a lot of information and I don't have too much time. So I want to get be concise and to the point, but I hope, getting some ideas and don't worry guys at the end i'm um uh, yeah i'm gonna do it. i'm gonna give you access to an ebook that i wrote and it basically has this information plus much more i mean the ebook is really packed with knowledge it's, that's what i'm everyone is gonna get one okay russ so i'm gonna do that for everybody but i'll tell you where to get it at, at the end all right let's go to the next light and let's keep going now there are two types of administration, independent versus dependent. Let me explain. It's really simple. An independent administration, it means that the personal representative, executor, or administrator can move forward in the decision-making without any court supervision. So in other words, um, they, they can sell the house. They don't have to tell the court what they're doing, what they're selling. In a dependent administration, they can still make decisions, but now those decisions have to be supervised by the court which in some parts of the country, for example, if they're selling the house, they have to tell the court, the house is sold. Can you give the blessings and approve this contract so we can close the deal? In some courthouses across the country, they do that. It's called a supervised sale. Okay? But that's, you don't really need, you know, it's, this is more from an educational perspective. In case you have a listing that the court has to approve, you know that it's a dependent administration. Independent administration, then you just do it without, it's, not, it's another regular sale. And I will say about 70% of private real estate are independent administrations. So it's, it's, it's easy. And, and I tell you, don't worry about whether it's independent or dependent. Get the listing. You get the listing, you close the transaction, you get paid. And that's the bottom line. You get paid. Okay? Now, in any business, whether it's real estate, whether it's uh, you know cars or computers, Partnerships is what makes our business grow. So I'm going to give you some ideas of who will be the ideal partner to your probate business. Because the partners are going to help you generate more listing. 
So the first person that I want you to build a partnership with will be attorneys. Attorneys have their hand on those files all day long. So how do you build a relationship with an attorney? You steer business to them and they'll reciprocate by giving you business back. But you have to be the moving part. You have to be the one that's got to start the conversation. So whenever you run into people who are asking you legal questions and you're not allowed to give any legal advice, that's when I pull my attorney friend who I'm going to refer them to. And that attorney is going to appreciate because now you are prospecting for him or her. And in return, then they begin to throw leads back at you who are probably potential probably listings. I hope this is making sense. Another great partner to have with paralegals. Paralegals work with attorneys and sometimes they work directly with the personal representative. So paralegals are fantastic leads, fantastic partners to generate leads from us. Uh, CPAs, financial planners, bookkeepers, outstanding, definitely, because when a person passes away, the estate has to file the uh, tax forms. So they go to CPAs or bookkeepers or financial planners to help them with the tax return uh, as they settle the estate. So those are good, you know, good leads. Another one, charitable organizations. When someone passes away, and uh, they like to donate things to organizations. I've seen houses being donated to church, being donated to the American Cancer Society. Wealthy people, and by the way, wealthy people does not equal living trust. Remember, I, remember the collage I gave you? Wealthy people means equals they die just like the poor people. So, but sometimes they have wills, and when they do have wills, they donate real estate to them. So, contacting a charitable organization and letting them know that you can handle probate sales, uh, state sales, you know, trustee sales, all those things, because the moment they receive a piece of property, they want to liquidate so they can have the cash available so they can continue whatever their mission is. And the last one, which, oh my gosh, you gotta, you gotta build a relationship with these people. Assistant living communities. Phenomenal, phenomenal lead generator. Because a lot of these people, they're going to these assistant living communities, they have to sell their home first to have the income to be able to provide that monthly expense. So those are great contacts. Now you have a great pool of partners to work with and generate more business. As you prospect yourself, of course, you're one of them, but now you can duplicate yourself through them. All right, let me kind of quickly give you the overall how the whole probate team flows. So everything is filed to the local probate court. In some parts of the country, the personal representative can file on their own, without an attorney, the paperwork. In other parts of the country, they have to have an attorney representing them. For example, in Florida, Florida, you got to have an attorney. California, you don't have to have an attorney. Texas, you don't have to have an attorney. So either way, whether it's the personal representative himself or herself, or the attorney, they're going to file the paperwork to the probate court. Remember, petition for probate, that is the first document that gets filed to the court. That is your lead. Once they file, that lead becomes public record. And now you can walk up to the court, pull that lead, extract the information, and now you're going to contact first. The first person you're going to start prospecting is the personal representative. Why? Because they're the only ones that can make the final decision, not the attorney. The attorney advice. The personal representative but the attorney does not make all the final decisions so it's the pr so if you don't know any attorneys just go straight to the pr and start building that relationship that's how i started this entire business and then if for some reason you cannot get hold of the pr by the way let me give you the magic number if you're expecting to make one phone call or send one letter and have a call someone call you back to get it, it's not going to work I've been doing this for almost 30 years, and I can tell you, the magic number, the magic follow-up number on this niche is six to eight calls. I'm sorry, not calls, six to eight contacts. And a phone call is a contact, a letter is a contact, a door knock is a contact. Just make sure you are constantly on their mind, either through paper, direct email, phone call, whatever you can. You do that six times, and you will get that appointment. Now, if for some reason you're not able to do that and not able to accomplish that appointment or that call, just go directly to the attorney. And now that is your last, that is your last stop. When you call the attorney, be ready to speak attorney language. 
be ready to be very direct and to the point. Because if you want to chit chat with them, they'll hang up on you. Okay. So there is an art to it. And uh, the ebook will have that info. Read the ebook. The ebook that I'm going to give you guys access has things like that. It'll, it'll go into more detail about Chinese. All right. Now, the probate leave. This is the petition for probate. I'm going to show different samples from different parts of the country so you get to see what I've been talking about the whole time. Uh, state of Oregon. Here's, a, here's an example. Okay. There is the case number, and here is the petitioner. That is the person that's asking the court to be in charge of that estate. And then there is the decedent's name, Daphne. She's the person that died. This is where she lived. So now I have real estate that I can go back into tax records and see if this matches the deceased name person. Because if that is, not all, let me explain. Not all petitions show real estate. And because it doesn't, if it doesn't show real estate, it doesn't mean there's no real estate. That's one thing that I want you guys to really remember. Always assume there's real estate unless the person says, we don't have any real estate. Because I found myself, my personal experience, where there was no real estate listed on anywhere in the petition, but they had real estate. On one case, I was calling for a house in LA, and I found a house in Las Vegas, land in near Palm Springs. They have multiple pieces. So that was one huge lesson that I learned in that process, okay? So there is one address that we can look. Now, here is the uh, Julie, which is the petitioner, address and phone number. So in the state of Oregon, I get the whole thing. Uh, phone number is a bonus, I tell you, because they usually don't have the phone numbers, but instead of Oregon, they put their phone number, so that's great. And then you have, uh, let's see over here, as far as I know, the petitioner, natural, there is, uh, aggregate value and all this. So there's, there's money there. There's real estate. This is a good lead to follow because there's $750,000 or less worth of valuable things. Okay. And includes a real estate, the real property. All right. And uh, there's the attorney information. So now let me recap. I know who's going to be in charge. I have the, her address, phone number. I know who died. I know I have an address which I need to go down and do a little digging to find out that's, that, that address matches. And I know the attorney's information. That is what I need to go prospect. That is your lead. This is what I was telling you. It's called a petition for probate. All right, this was California. Let's go over this real quick. Attorney's information. This is the person who died. This is the case number. This is the person who is petitioning to become the executor. And there is the address of the person that died this is street address, city and county, decedent's residence at time of death. So there's an address, and on the next page, gross fair market value of real property, 700,000. So I know there's real estate. The house is worth 700 grand. So this is a great lead so far. And then this is Alan Carroll's address, no phone number. So I'll have to be a little more creative to be able to find the phone number, but there is Alan's information, okay? So I hope this is making, you know, making sense. Now, this is from the state of Florida. This is the case number, the person that died, the petitioner address. This is the petitioner's attorney. So there's, there's it's on the first page is right there. And then it says, decedents and whose last known address, there is the address. So now I know there's real estate in this specific case. And uh, they tell me that it's value at 55,000. So, there's real estate, there is the money, and there is the attorney's information. So it's really easy, guys. This is pretty easy. Now, the state of Nevada. Yeah, let me show you. There is the information for the uh, attorney, case number, person who died. This is the, oh, the attorney is going to become the personal representative, which, which is okay. And there is the property, one property, $95,000. Uh, there's a lien and no mortgage. Is a HELOC on it for 40000 So I know there's real estate here. Next page, there's a second property for the 126 6, and there's a loan on it. And look at all the outstanding debt. Think about it. The two properties have an outstanding mortgage, and there's credit card debt worth almost $30,000. What do you think is going to happen? This is why I love this niche market. This is a done deal. This is a hot, hot, hot. This is something that I'll get on it right away and start talking to the attorney. And there's the attorney's information and phone number. All right, so I went through a lot, a lot of information very, very quickly. 
And uh, I hope you guys were able to capture some of the good info here, some of the, the, the education I was sharing with you. But let me leave you with this. As the population ages, the next real estate boom will be at the public courthouse. And that is true. This is the next real estate boom in this country because you know the largest living people are the elderly. We have a huge generation. So here's an opportunity for us realtors to come and help these individuals, help the personal representatives, help them liquidate the estate and really make a difference. And along the and along the journey, guys, we are going to make a ton of money because there's so much real estate that will have to go through the public court. And, and I hope you got the picture. But like I said, I told you earlier, I'm going to give you access to an ebook. Okay, this ebook is like 75. It's a phenomenal book. Lots of information, similar to what I shared with you today. So to get your ebook, just uh, go to this website, getprobatetraining.com, and it's just fill in the information. It's going to download the ebook right away, so you can begin reading more, learning more about it. But if you have any questions specifically that, that you're wondering, feel free to call. Uh, you can speak to one of enrollment advisors and they can tell you, you know, they can give you the answer and whatever questions you have. Just, uh, you know, call the 562-421-3539. So 562-421-3539. And uh, they will help you out. So I hope it was informative. I hope uh, I was able to do a good job in teaching you, getting you exposed to this. And again, I want to thank Annie Mac, Forks, and Russ for allowing me to do this. And again, thank you so much. You guys have a great day. Uh, just go ahead and download the ebook or give us a call and then we'll help you out. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. All righty. Um, why is my video not on? Um, <laughs> yeah, man, I, I don't know. That was. Uh, that was exciting stuff. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. The one thing that we talked about, if you guys were on the call yesterday, um, I think one thing that's super important is when you're reaching out to these folks is coming from a place of an eye, right? I think you'll get, and I, he mentioned it and alluded to it a little bit, but I think you'll get trashed on that first phone call if you lead with like, hey, I'm a realtor. Like, I want to sell your house. Like, I think you'll get trashed if you lead with that. So I think definitely having some kind of eye, some kind of like, hey, you know, I completely understand the situation. You know, your attorney advised that I reach out to you to kind of help talk you through this tough time. Um, let me know when it's a good time to discuss what it looks like to sell the property. But um, yeah. And if, 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 if you have any other questions, like, and you want to shoot me an email at any time, I can reach out to Russ who controls all of Animac works and answer your question specifically on this topic as well. Obviously I probably don't know the answers, so I'd have to reach out um, to Russ and get the actual answers. If you, if you have anything on this subject, um, I'll put my, I'll put my email in the chat for you and you could reach out at any time and answers for you if you have it. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for inviting me, Bobo. Yes. Let's see how we do it here. All right, I see one. I'm gonna write it down yep. just for Charles. Give me, give me your, uh, give me your email too, so I can get back to you. Okay. Actually, anyone that's on the call, real quick, still. Um, I think, Dietra, we have yours. Just fire your email real quick in there so we can follow up with you, if you don't mind. Anastasia, if you could just shoot your email address in there. I think I might have yours, but I'm not sure. If you don't mind, that way, perfect, thank you. That way we can just follow up with you and, and, and make sure you have all your questions answered, so. All right, I'll, I'll get that for you too, Anastasia, okay? Perfect. Gmail. Awesome, there we go. Awesome. 
Thanks for attending, everyone. If, if uh, like I said, if you guys have any questions, just shoot them, shoot them out. Um, we we got to hop on <laughs> another Zoom right now. So I hope you enjoyed, and hopefully we can bring some more content to you over the next couple of weeks as well. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Thank you very much, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.